So I think it's time to start our second session of the day, which is going to be on beliefs, trading, and financial markets. Uh, in this second session, we'll have three interesting papers. The first one will be uh, from Philippe Schirmer from University of Bonn, and he's going to talk uh, to, uh, to us about mental models of the stock uh, market. Um, our second presenter will be uh, Chen Wen from University of Notre Dame, and he's going to discuss the impact of beliefs on credit, credit markets, evidence from a rating agency. And our uh, last presenter um, is going to be Michael Weber from the University of Chicago, and he's going to talk about inflation and trading. So I um, hope you all uh, interesting a session. So I would like to invite our first discussion, Mr. Philip Schirmer. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. Um, this is uh, Mental Models of the Stock Market, joint work with Peter Andre uh, and Johannes Wolfhardt. And so to, sorry, this clicker is right. Excellent. So to set the stage, I want to move us um, now a little bit from inflation expectations to another central expectations object, namely um, return expectations, in particular stock return expectations. So financial markets, stock markets revolve crucially about market participants' return expectations. And it seems clear that these expectations don't come out of thin air, but are rather formed in light of some deeper understanding that market participants have of the stock market. And this is what we're gonna name or give the name of the mental models to. So this deeper understanding is what we're gonna study. Now there's um, growing literature on, on all kinds of economic expectations, but the, the origin and the exact formation of stock market expectations or return expectations remains for the most part a black box. So what we aim to do in our project is to study exactly this, try to pry open this black box and study participants' uh, mental models. In our work, we're gonna focus on three broader categories of mental models that we're gonna study. So the first category is what you might think of as textbook models, models of market efficiency, the notion that um, stock prices um, quickly uh, incorporate new information, quickly and completely, and that all differences in uh, stock return expectations can be traced back to differences in the risk factor exposure of stocks. To contrast this, um, there's models that claim markets are not fully efficient, but rather exhibit tendencies of temporary mispricing. So these might be models of uh, temporary overreaction. Think about momentum models, for example, that claim that stocks, stock prices initially overreact and later on revert, leading to predictably lower returns for a while. Or on the other hand, models um, that, that argue that stock prices tend to react too sluggishly, to underreact to news, leading to predictably higher returns for a while after good news. And now what we also find is an uh, empirically common third category is what we call models of equilibrium neglect. These are models in which, um, in which for example, uh, expected earnings are directly linked to expected returns, not taking account or not fully taking account um, equilibrium pricing that occurs on financial markets. So what we're gonna do to uh, briefly preview our work, um, we develop a tailored survey-based approach in which we run thought experiments with different groups of investors. I'll talk about the groups in more detail later. In particular, we're um, surveying the general population as well as retail investors. We're also um, accessing two different samples of financial, uh, financial professionals, one in uh, advisors, whom we think of representing more the, the lower uh, segment of the industry, but also fund managers that are the, uh, representing the higher segment of the industry. We're not restarting here. Um, and uh, I'll just keep, keep going, hope this disappears. Um, so to preview our findings, we find um, considerable, considerable disagreement in the mental models held by different market participants, in particular across different groups of investors. Thank you very much. And um, one particularly striking finding is a large uh, tendency to seemingly neglect equilibrium forces on financial markets, quite strongly uh, among households, but also to some extent among financial professionals. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our measurement, to the, um, to the thought experiments we run and how we can elicit both return expectations but also the underlying mental models of uh, investors. So to introduce you, I wanna kind of show you the, the central thought experiment consisting of two hypothetical scenarios about a, a, a stock company. So think about Nike and think about first a, a neutral scenario about Nike. For example, Nike maintaining their supplier partnership. So four weeks ago, Nike announced the continuation of its partnership with major uh, polyester supplier Torrey Industries in a move aimed at retaining its current supply chain. The continuation of the partnership is expected, uh, sorry, expected to maintain the company's current cost structure, and industry experts were not surprised uh, by the announcement as continuity and supply relationships are common practice in the industry. Contrast this with a second scenario that spells good news for Nike. 
Nike secures a cost-saving partnership. Four weeks ago, on the, uh, here in this case, uh, April 29th, Nike announced a new strategic partnership with leading, leading recycled polyester supplier Unify Inc. aimed at reducing raw material costs by 20%. The deal is expected to have a significant impact on Nike's bottom line, making its products more price competitive. Industry experts were pleasantly surprised by the news and dubbed it an unexpected success for the company. They projected the move to significantly enhance Nike's market position in the sports apparel industry. So we introduced subjects or participants in all our um, surveys with these kind of alternative and hypothetical uh, news pieces about, in this case, uh, Nike. We stressed to participants that these news are four weeks old and have received a lot of attention by market participants. And uh, for, for, for example, for households, we also ensure this in comprehension questions. And so now the, the first question we ask our participants is, is suppose you're investing now a sum of $1,000 into Nike four weeks after these announcements have hit. So today, four weeks after the announcements, and for one, for one year. In, under which of the two scenarios would you predict the return in Nike stock to be higher? Is that the rather good news scenario two, the neutral news scenario one, or do you expect them to be similar in both scenarios? That's our uh, most basic uh, return excitation that we, that we run. And right afterwards, we remind subjects, participants, what they just uh, predicted and ask them in an open text um, prompt to explain why they think this would be the case. So now let's, let's briefly consider what might investors with different models reason um, in response to these two news. So an investor holding a model broadly in line of vision markets might argue that, well, after four weeks, these are stale news. These news should already be priced in in Nike stock, and therefore the returns I can expect from an investment in Nike stock should be similar unless I expect um, the, the beta, so the, the risk factor of the company has changed with the announcement. In contrast, participants, um, stock market participants reasoning along the lines of temporary mispricing might either argue that stock markets are prone to underreact, so that after four weeks, in fact, not all information has been priced in, and Nike's returns might be predictably higher after the good news, or rather to argue that Nike has a ten, uh, sorry, stock markets have a tendency to overreact, meaning that the returns might be initially too high or the stock price adjusts too much in the first four weeks and then revert over the next period of, say, a year, leading to predictably lower returns. Now, our third category, uh, agents neglecting equilibrium pricing, might argue that because expected earnings are higher in the good news scenario and in some sense disregarding what has happened on financial markets in the meantime, um, expected returns will stay higher uh, in, this, in the good news scenario for you know, an extended period of time. So we can always see that in this uh, you know, relatively simple and easy to understand uh, thought experiment, different models would lead to different return expectations, different predictions. And what we do in our, uh, in our paper is we measure mental models, both by measuring expectations about returns, but also other cofactors that might shape them. We investigate the explanations uh, participants give us in their open text responses, and we conduct further experiments with households, uh, zooming in on the, on the phenomenon of equilibrium neglect. Okay, so speaking of the samples, I've already mentioned we are using samples of uh, the US general population that we um, sample from Dineda. We're also fortunate to um, speak to the German general population in a sample of the Bundesbank online panel. Uh, where we um, could include our, our module, and I'll talk about this briefly in the very end, what we can do specifically with this, this data uh, additionally. Um, for retail investors, we're um, serving US retail investors on Prolific and uh, German retail investors with a German bank. And for the financial professionals, we have both access to financial advisors and, and uh, analysts that we think of presenting more the lower segment, but also a sample of quite uh, you know, highly trained and directly involved um, fund managers at two large German asset management companies. And last but, last but not least, we have a sample around 100 academic experts that we invited in our, to our survey that serve as kind of an academic benchmark. Okay, that being said, let me come to, the, to our first finding, namely the tendency to make this uh, inference from stale news to future returns. What I'm gonna show you here on this uh, bar chart is on the x-axis, the different, uh, different samples that we, that we conducted the survey with. And then as the bar, the frequency or the tendency uh, among these samples to make either news congruent forecasts, so predicting higher returns uh, for, uh, for the next year after good news, or vice versa, um, predicting lower, lower returns after bad news scenarios. Um, making a similar forecast in gray and uh, making the reverse forecast as here in, in red. 
So without, maybe not surprisingly, academic experts predominantly predict returns to be similar. So almost three quarters of our academic experts say that there's no discernible or no, no significant difference in the returns um, four weeks after the news. So this is already uh, indicating a bit of, a, of an uh, efficient markets reasoning, of course. Um, so does, does academic experts predictions also map over to households? Quite simply speaking, it does not. For households, we find almost virtually the flipped picture. So at least half up to more than uh, three, uh, fourths, uh, three quarters of our uh, households, um, both the general population, but also more specifically retail investors, predict returns actually be, to be persistently higher after good news. On the flip side, only a quite small share predicts returns to be similar and uh, about the same shares for economic experts predicts returns to be lower after good news. So a very striking difference already between academic experts and you know, households here. And now if we look at financial professionals, the picture's a little bit more mixed. The more entry-level financial professionals um, make forecasts broadly in lines with what we see for households. A large share of about 70% predicting uh, news congruent, making news congruent forecasts, only 12% predicting returns to be similar. And uh, fund managers, or well, a bit more, a bit more um, sophisticated uh, financial professionals, they also uh, exhibit the largest heterogeneity in their forecasts. So about a third predicts returns to be similar, uh, some 15% predicting returns to be the reverse, um, but also still more than half predicts returns to be higher, even four, new, four weeks after the news. So now one concern that one might have is that this is, for example, driven by the specific scenario pair that we produce, by, by Nike as a company, by this good news versus bad news comparison. So what we do is we, we show the robustness of this finding um, for households with mer lots of different scenarios, varying the company, also varying the valence of the news. Um, and also show that this is a phenomenon that's not just kind of for the very first year, or four weeks plus one year after the news, but rather that this tendency remains um, for a sizable fraction of the participants, also for the second to fifth year of the forecast. So this is a quite stable phenomenon. And now one might ask, well, where does this trace from? So with that, without further ado, let me then come to the, the mental models underlying these return forecasts. And just to provide you some, some flavor of what we're finding, um, let's think about an academic expert. So one response received is that in efficient markets, the information should be fully incorporated into stock price four weeks after the announcement. Thus, going forward, Nike will earn its expected return, which is the same in both scenarios, as beta did not change due to the announcement. So as you might say, a textbook, um, textbook efficient markets response, I don't expect changes in the beta, therefore I don't think returns should be different. Contrast this with a household that argues, well, by changing the supplier, Nike is saving money, which would mean greater returns for them and greater returns for me. Quite straightforward. A financial, ex financial professionals, however, seem to reason similarly. One, one of them, for example, saying that I would expect that lower production costs should lead to higher earnings on the company side and as such increase the total return of the investment. So here in these examples, you already can see that, you know, a, uh, subjects or participants are quite able to articulate their reasoning. It just happens to be very different. And to, to do this in a more systematic way, we, um, have trained, uh, trained economists uh, kind of label all these responses and give us a you know, the picture of, of all the responses. And we find this broadly representative. So academic experts, um, almost 80% make, uh, make arguments um, in lines of efficient markets, predominantly arguing along the lines of information efficiency, that these four weeks are enough for, return, for stock prices to have fully reacted. A few of them also arguing that you know, differences can be traced back to difference in, in risk exposure of the company. Um, on the flip side, very little uh, reasoning along the lines of temporary mispricing, but also little uh, evidence of equilibrium neglect. Again, in stark contrast are the households, where we find around about 50% of them seemingly directly jumping from expected earnings to expected returns, neglecting equilibrium forces. Um, again, a small share of temporary mispricing, but also here a very small share of, of households that um, are along the lines of efficient markets. This broadly holds also for our entry-level financial advisors. And now the, the most interesting group probably are the fund managers, the ones that are most directly involved also in, in trading. And what you find is that these, this group of investors also has the largest heterogeneity. So here we have around about a third of them um, drawing uh, to arguments on, of efficient markets. Another third, or sorry, some 20% um, employing models of temporary mispricing, broadly split between models of overreaction, uh, say momentum, or uh, some underreaction, some sluggishness of the prices. And a bit more than a third, a third still seems to neglect equilibrium neglect in, our, in, the re, in the reasoning. So quite a striking heterogeneity, both in the returns that these investors make, but also in the reasoning they employ to, 
you know, to make these forecasts. Now, what we do in the paper, what I'm skipping in the interest of time, is we also look at other cofactor expectations that our participants uh, make. So, for example, how do they expect uh, the earnings to, to change in response to the news? How do they expect the, the beta of the company to change? And what we find is reassuringly that, in, in fact, uh, ex experts' return expectations are predicted by the differences in, in risk exposure they expect, um, whereas earnings are much less predictive of their, of their return expectations. On the, for households on the flip side, um, their return expectations are strongly predicted also by their expected differences in earnings. And for in additional experiments for households, we also show that this is robust to you know, um, asking subjects to, or shutting down uh, channels of risk exposure and mispricing. So specifically telling subjects, suppose that there is no change in the, in the risk exposure across scenarios, or suppose that there's no mispricing occurring. This leaves the, uh, leaves the forecast virtually unchanged. So this does not seem to be driving their, their, their forecasts. So what else is driving it then? So what, what explains this large share of, um, of equilibrium neglect reasoning among our households? And to do so, we investigate broadly two different hypotheses. One of them is a hypothesis of, of inattention, or rather inattention to the, to the right kind of variables. So it might be that households are just inattentive to the reaction of other traders and to the ensuing price response. They might just not reason to that and not, might not come to their mind. And that's the reason why they keep inferring that, uh, that returns must be higher. So what we do is we draw attention, um, we exogenously draw attention to, to other traders' response in the stock price, asking participants to first think about what would have happened to the price, will have gone up in one scenario or the other, and, and what will other traders have done. But what we find is drawing attention, having subjects, um, you know, reason to price changes, um, also leaves the, leaves the um, tendency virtually unchanged. So, I mean, single, si a single percentage point shifts here by whether subjects are you know, made to pay attention to stock price changes or other, other people's trading response. So it seems unlikely that an attention is story is driving it. Another, st another hypothesis might be that it's rather a, a gap in the mental model. So just a fundamental failure to understand equilibrium forces. So what we do is we um, deploy an, an intervention where we teach uh, participants, households here, um, the notion of equilibrium forces on financial markets. And what we see that this does in fact shift their forecasts substantially. So about 20 percentage points um, more households now make similar return forecasts. On the flip side, about 20 percent fewer, percentage points fewer make this news concurrent forecast. So what we can infer from this is that it does seem to be a gap in their mental model and non-understanding of equilibrium forces that drives their, um, their return forecasts. Okay. In the, in the last minutes, I want to briefly uh, mention in a bit teaser um, what consequences this equilibrium neglect might, might carry. So what, what we can do is we can, we, we were fortunate to include our module in the, the Bundesbank online panel which, of course, in this panel dimension, not only, you know, not only elicits um, our, a, a short version of our module, think about the key questions, uh, the, the key return question here, but we can also see how households' um, return expectations move over time. And what we find that equilibrium neglect, as we measured in our module, is in fact predictive of um, two important belief anomalies, namely procyclicality in uh, expectations and also extrapolation. And more broadly speaking, this research could therefore speak to, to a larger group of anomalies. So I've already mentioned procyclical beliefs and extrapolated beliefs, but it could also explain the notion of overtrading. So if I think, of course, that, that news remain relevant, I might keep acting on these, on these news, even if they're stale. I, um, in particular, might trade in response to stale news. It could also explain, however, on the flip side, why I perceive high participation costs, because I think there's this need to stay up, stay informed, and that news, you know, don't become incorporated. If I know that news kind of becomes stale, I might not need to pay attention to them. And it might also explain a preference for active investment. So quite striking um, you know, findings that we have in the difference in return expectations that we can trace back to the difference in models. So let me, let me conclude. So we, in our specifically designed tailored survey, we find a vast difference in the inference to, from stale news which is negligible among academic experts, but widespread for virtually everyone else. We can trace back this difference in, in the inference from stale news to difference in the underlying mental models, where experts reason predominantly along the lines of efficient markets, but households and financial advisors um, seemingly neglecting equilibrium prices or price, uh, price forces. 
And we can even, you know, even trace back some of this reasoning for the financial professionals that are most involved, our fund managers. With households, we can then trace back these differences, or oh, sorry, sorry the, this, the origins of equipment neglect, only distributing or assigning a limited role to attention to the trading and price responses on markets, but rather a gap in the mental model, namely a fundamental failure to understand equilibrium forces. And as I've mentioned, and mostly teasered here in this talk today, uh, we can also speak to the consequences, showing that equilibrium neglect correlates, predicts um, extrapolative and prosecutive return expectations, and might therefore be an underpinning for a larger, you know, larger explanation of, of anomalies we found. And with that, I'm coming uh, to an end 20 seconds early, but I think that's okay. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Philippe, for your presentation. Uh, it's fascinating to see how many people are not aware of market efficiency or price equilibrium adjustments. So before we open the floor, I think we have around 10 minutes. I would just want to throw in one. You talk about uh, a neutral scenario where you, you provide information to people where Nike, for instance, would keep its current productions. But in the context that the, the survey was done after COVID, uh, you know, and, and all the news about securing supply chains and so on, how, how neutral do you think that uh, that scenario could be? So that, that's my questions. And now I um, would like to open uh, the floor for many for the other questions. I remind people that please, um, you know, um, tell your name and affiliation. So. Hi, uh, this is uh, Claudio Ferreira from Bank of Spain. Uh, first of all, it's fascinating paper, uh, I, I, and, I, and I thought it was very interesting, something you mentioned, if, if I understood correctly, you were saying that among fi financial experts, those that uh, are new to the job, they tend to have expe uh, like mental models, or, or let's say expectations or mental models or expectations about return, more similar to households, and those that are more experienced, they tend to have a, a mental model more close to uh, efficient market workings, if I understood correctly, right? If so, uh, have you have you studied if there's some kind of selection uh, effect going on there? Those maybe <laughs> uh, whether those that uh, enter the, the 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 job and keep this uh, misunderstanding certain uh, market forces they drop out uh, or not? Uh, there's some if there's something like that. Other question. Sure. <laughs> Michael Weber, University of Chicago. So I was actually wondering whether you can say something a little bit about what you think the objective benchmark should be, in the sense that you know maybe you know, I know I get an email as an academic that has published in so-called uh, top journals, and I know that it's colleagues who want to actually publish a paper, and so therefore there's maybe a certain demand effect. That's the first aspect. But then maybe you know if you are asking me now as a fund manager, I know that there's I guess what sometimes refer to as dump money out there, in the sense that empirically there is potentially like short-term momentum, and so because of that, like I would maybe then actually uh, uh, answer in the survey that maybe actually good news in terms of returns, uh, in terms of earnings, also means actually high returns going forward. So just a little bit kind of maybe laying out a bit more what your ex anti hypothesis are and what you think is the objective benchmark. Now, of course, like it's kind of very uh, I don't, it's telling that consumers just seem to lack this understanding that you know, if everyone kind of has this news, it should be already in the price. But I think you know, maybe some of them also kind of then say, well, it's uh, high returns because of maybe just return continuation. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Dimitris Georgarakos from uh, ECB. Um, just to complement Michael's point, uh, but from consumer's perspective, uh, do you know information whether people have invested already in stocks or mutual funds? And uh, what is their experience or probably if they interact with financial advisors, etc.? I think this would be an important form of heterogeneity to look at if they develop kind of similar through this experience. They develop kind of similar, uh, different narratives or similar narratives. Uh, Jeff Kenny uh, from the European Central Bank as well. So thank you very much for this. I've, I found it fascinating. Um, so I, I have a comment uh, on the result for the academics. 
many in the room, of course. And uh, I'm guessing it might come as a bit of a surprise to many of the people in the room that they all believe in efficient markets. Um, I was listening to uh, an interview with Eugene Fama there recently, and he gave you the impression that he was a holdout guy where most of the profession now didn't believe in efficient markets. But I'm, I'm thinking this links a little bit to your design um, and the fact that you have this four-week stale news. So economists may not believe in efficient markets, but they think the, the temporary mispricing has all expired by, by that time. And if you ran it with kind of uh, shorter uh, periods, perhaps you would get uh, a slightly different result for the, for the academic uh, group. Thanks. Okay. One last question. Uh, Stefano Ramelli from the University of St. Gallen. Fascinating paper, I like it a lot. I was wondering where uh, demand system as a pricing, so uh, return coming from uh, demand pressure by institutional investor, in which mental model would uh, end up? Which? Yeah, one, one final from Giorgio. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Giorgio Toppen, New York Fed. Um, I found it very interesting as well. I, more of a comment. I was just wondering, um, you mentioned some of the implications that your finding would have uh, for certain stylized facts in how uh, stock prices move and so on. I was wondering, um, you know, if you could maybe run a horse race between your um, model and, for instance, diagnostic expectations, which also seem to match some of the stylized facts about uh, stock price movements. Thanks. Great, then yep. let's get to it. Okay. Thank you so much. Excellent questions from everybody. So maybe first I'll start with your question too, because it was uh, kind of on the survey design. So the question was kind of how neutral is the neutral scenario? And um, it's a fair point that, you know, you might say in very un uncertain times, retaining one supply chain might already be good news in some sense. So really what we're after is kind of a difference in the valence between these two news. So if, the, if one piece of neutral is already might perceived as good, but the other one much better, you should still see a return difference or no return difference based on your model. So, so, so we're not really um, glued to having a specific, like an exactly zero news event. It's rather that the difference is there. We create some, you might say, some first stage in the earnings uh, expectations, some difference across scenarios. And that's what we can then do to elicit mental models. But very good question. Um, then maybe I'm coming to, to the first of Michael's points on the question of the objective benchmark and also coming a bit to the, um, what you mentioned on, on Gene Pharma being maybe the last holdout. I can't speak to that yet. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how, how that is broadly distributed. But so, so first of all, I should have stressed that we, we don't claim that these academic experts are the objective benchmark. I mean, they are also a perspective on financial markets. It need not be that that's the truth. So just because 80% say that markets are efficient, that by itself doesn't make them efficient, of course. Um, so, I mean, in, in, in response to these demand effects, um, I, I think experts were very happy to, to give us their, you know, their preferred take on what, how they think you know, markets work and kind of like not so much answering what we wanted to hear, I would say, but rather this is, this is why, it, you know, this, is, this is my theory of how markets work. So presenting their, their model of the world rather than, than that. And the people that do disagree with the, you know, make different forecasts, they also then present very different models. For example, there are some experts that do rely on momentum reasoning, just, just much fewer than the, the efficient markets. Um, we specifically tailored it also to be about uh, these, these four weeks because there are, is some evidence, for example, on short-term momentum. So for example, intraday, there might be some you know, price discovery happening after news. So this is kind of like a bit of, a, of an, an edge, edge case then where we didn't want to take a strong stance on that. But as we see, like after four weeks, there's still a significant heterogeneity in forecasts, which is what we focus on. Great. Um, on the, uh, briefly on the, on the selection on financial experts, I guess it's what over there, uh, uh, sorry, financial professionals. So I'm a bit cautious because these are two different groups of financial professionals, different companies, different, um, you know, diff a little bit different, different work. Also, the lower professional, lower level professionals are more advisors and, and analysts. So you might also say in some sense they're closer to the households than maybe the fund managers. 
So it's, it's, it's reasonable that the fund managers have different, whole different mental models. I'm not sure we can trace that back to selection. I just want to be cautious with that statement. Might well be, but um, so the difference are also difference across samples. Um, right. Um, then we had a question on, so on, on the household side, whether investment experience, for example, matters. And what we, what we do find is, I mean, we specifically uh, use the retail investor sample for that. So the general population are investors and non-investors. And the retail investors, we restrict the sample f either for people coming from a bank for whom we know that they're uh, trading, they have uh, depots uh, or investments. And for, for, uh, for our retail investors on pr prolific, we sample on um, a certain amount of minimum investment and investment experience for that too. We also collect information on financial literacy, but we find that that, if anything, makes people more likely to, um, to, to make these, uh, uh, to, to exhibit equilibrium neglect models. So within households, it does, does not seem to be driven by an experience in stock markets, or if anything, you know, you might say there might be a false um, you know, confidence in, in one's model, and maybe the ability to articulate it a bit better, but not a difference in models. Great, um, yeah, I think that's most of the questions. But I'm very happy to also answer questions afterwards now. Thank you very much. So thank you, Philip. I think we're right on time. So I would like to invite our next presenter, Chen Wang from University of Notre Dame. OK, yeah, thank you very much for uh, having the paper on the program. This is a joint work with uh, Greg Wetzner from McGill. In this paper, we try to study the impact of beliefs on the credit market. So this question actually has intrigued economists and the scholars ever since, uh, ever since uh, Minsky's uh, financial instability hypothesis. And recently, John Dinacopoulos and uh, Badalo et al. and many other papers have studied how heterogeneous beliefs and often distorted beliefs uh, really impact uh, the credit and the leverage cycles. Despite all of the advancement we have uh, in the, on the theory side, but we seem to have very limited uh, experiences or uh, evidence on the empirical side for various good reasons. Uh, I think most importantly, despite the fact that we have already like available survey data uh, across many different, um, and, and in different uh, sectors of economy, measuring to, or directly measuring the effect of beliefs on the credit market is still a, a very challenging job. There are three reasons or three questions I think uh, definitely uh, these are questions that have surfaced uh, uh, across today's talks. That first, it's unclear whether people are actually act in accordance with their illicit beliefs. So they may say something, but uh, whenever it comes to action, they do something completely different. And second, so it's unclear whose beliefs really matter for uh, the uh, economic outcomes and asset prices. And lastly, uh, it's also with all, th all the things going on, it's uh, intrinsically a very complicated job to especially uh, isolate the, uh, the component of uh, beliefs, especially subjective beliefs, from all of the other economic forces and the factors. So here's uh, where our paper comes into this uh, basically question. We try to uh, take a new approach by focusing on a pivotal group in the credit market, which, are, uh, which is the credit rating agencies. Specifically, we look at the beliefs of the Moody's and S&P, and we, uh, I think it's needless to say, given how concentrated the credit rating agencies are in this market, uh, they are playing a very important role, first of all. The firms rely on uh, the agencies to rate their debt whenever they have to tap the capital markets. And secondly, investors really rely on the credit ratings for credit assessment and also for their investment decisions. Specifically, uh, so that was the, the first point we answered who, whose uh, beliefs matter. And we tried to say that the, it, at least in this specific setting, in the credit market, it is the credit rating agencies. And second, we answered the question of uh, uh, the last, last, basically the last question, what, what is, uh, so how can we isolate uh, the subjective component of the beliefs? Specifically in this setting, it allow us to actually take the difference between the beliefs for uh, a short horizon forecast of the credit spread from these rating agencies and compare that with uh, the forecast and the beliefs from the, all the other people in the, in the cross-section, all the other financial institutions. And we find that uh, these subjective beliefs uh, from the rating agencies, uh, their forecast actually deviates significantly from rational expectations. And also, they do not seem to predict uh, the future realized the credit spread above and beyond what's already included uh, in the prices or in the consensus. And lastly, uh, 
uh, despite all of these imperfections, still people, especially people within the same agencies, the credit analysts, they act uh, in accordance uh, with uh, the, the, the beliefs or forecasts made by their economists. So, we, so essentially the point number two, the question number two is also tapped here uh, through this analysis. So let me just give you a quick overview of what we have found. Uh, basically, whenever the rating agencies were more optimistic in their beliefs, in the sense uh, that they're forecasting a narrower credit spread in the future, uh, not only their own credit analysts will, will, will respond by issuing higher ratings, but also uh, uh, investors in the market will also kind of uh, respond because uh, this higher ratings or inflated ratings will induce certain mispricing. So the newly issued bonds will have a higher price, lower yield, and lower credit spread. But subsequently, because this is mainly built on uh, this unfounded optimism um, from the subjective beliefs, subsequently, if we follow what happened to the prices or returns of these bonds, they actually go in the opposite direction. Lastly, the firms also come into play, and they kind of take advantage of this, uh, uh, this mispricing and also sub, uh, subjectivity in the beliefs by issuing more whenever the uh, rating agencies are much more uh, optimistic. So our interpretation is uh, following. So basically, there are subject, uh, subjective beliefs from the rating agencies induce mispricing through their ratings in the bond market. And this subsequently is picked up by the firms through their issuance and, uh, uh, and investment decisions. And lastly, we close the paper by exploring what are the factors, systematic or idiosyncratic, uh, that drives this uh, subjective beliefs of the rating agencies, especially their economists. We find that, actually, uh, the chief economist's personal experience, some very personal idiosyncratic housing returns that seem to drive a large part of the variation of how they deviate uh, from the consensus, deviate from the, the rest of their peers. Okay, so let me quickly talk about the data and the measurement, and we can dive into the empirical uh, analysis. So the data, uh, the survey data, or the survey expectations are mainly from the blue chip financial forecast. Now it's a, a pretty standard data set in this literature. Um, and specifically, we focus on the quarterly forecast of a short term, short horizon. One quarter had uh, corporate uh, AAA credit spread, which in this paper we denote as uh, uh, AAA. So whenever I use AAA, it's actually referring to the AAA credit spread. And the credit spread is calculated as follows. Uh, it's the difference between uh, the yield of the AAA corporate bond index and a 10-year treasury yield, a 10-year zero coupon treasury yield. There are two, maybe two things I want to mention uh, here. The first one is, uh, despite the name, it's a AAA index, but also it actually tracks the bonds between, uh, with ratings between AA and AAA. So it's uh, basically a reasonably wide range of uh, bonds that's tracked by the index. So we're not looking at just the safest bond to whom the, the credit risk is not very uh, important. And second, uh, because all these bonds are coupon bonds, uh, so despite the fact that on average they have a maturity longer than 15 years, this is actually, if you look at the duration, it's not too distant from uh, a 10-year zero coupon treasury. So we take this data, we calculate the subjective, uh, or the, we, we calculate the forecast of the credit spread, and then we, uh, we try to uh, first study uh, the properties of this, uh, the forecast, and then we're trying to link this to different actions taken by different players in the credit market. Specifically, uh, one thing that really enables us to disentangle different, belief, uh, different beliefs is uh, really this feature from the data set, uh, because the, the identities of the forecasters are completely reviewed, not only what institutions they work for, but also who exactly are uh, those people who are responsible for making the forecast. So that's why we uh, focus on two sets. We focus on the uh, rating agencies, specifically uh, Moody's uh, Investment Service, MR, and S&P Global Ratings. So these, whenever I was, I'm referring to the rating agencies, I'm talking about these two who are participating uh, in the survey uh, from the early 2000s. <clears throat> and we take basically the average uh, forecast between the two agencies and uh, have an acronym for that, which is the AAA CRA. Uh, on the other hand, we have all the other participants from the financial institutions, from the economic consulting firms, and we calculate their consensus, the consensus or the average forecast from these people for the credit spread and call this uh, uh, AAA con. So all the other data sets are from pretty uh, standard database, so I will skip this. And the final sample is from 2002 to 2018, so basically right before the COVID pandemic. So 
So now that we have this, uh, uh, the measure, let's first take a look at what happened to, uh, or how we evaluate the forecast made by the CRAs or credit rating agencies. We adopt basically uh, the methodology developed by Yuri and Oli in their seminal work, essentially of this CG regression where we regress the forecast errors, ex post forecast errors on ex ante forecast revisions. The idea is very straightforward. So if these people hold rational expectations, um, Nothing basically should predict their ex post forecast error, so we should expect a beta of zero. However, if these people overreact, or I'm sorry, if these people underreact to new information, so whenever new information arrives, they uh, adjust their forecast uh, revision, but uh, if they underreact, subsequently we will see a continuation of the realized value, realized value in the same direction, so we have a positive beta. However, if they overreact, their re uh, revision's excessive, so subsequently the realized value has to go in the opposite direction, then we have a negative beta. Specifically to the negative beta, it's hard to reconcile this with uh, either uh, a noisy restaurant expectation or snake information, so it is very likely that if we have a negative beta and overreaction, it is due to some departure from our restaurant expectations. So this is what we find. If we regress this separately for the CRAs and for the consensus, we find that actually for the CRAs, they significantly deviate from zero, and especially in the, uh, in the form of an overreaction. However, we cannot reject rationality for the consensus. So this gives us basically an ex ante measure of subjective beliefs, or the, at least the subjective component of the CRA beliefs, which is literally a difference between uh, the CRA's belief, which is AAA CRA, and the consensus, which is basically captured by, uh, uh, by the second variable. So we call this main variable AAA div, or AAA deviation, that really kind of uh, captured this ex ante measure of uh, how much the, uh, what is the subjective component of the CRA's that seem to be uh, capturing this especially the uh, 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 <clears throat> departure from rationality. So the second question we look at is, despite the fact they're irrational, they may depart from uh, rational expectations, but may, there may be still some useful information that's contained in the ra rating agency surveys. So maybe they can, they can still review some useful information about the future realized value above and beyond what's being captured by the consensus. So that's the second regression we look at. We regress the realized credit spread onto the consensus survey from all the consensus forecasts from all the other uh, economists and also the AAA deviation, um, the subjective part from the rating agencies. However, we find that if we regress a, like a realized value on deviation standard, uh, triple A deviation alone, or on the triple A deviation together, together with the consensus, the deviation part does nothing uh, in terms of forecasting the future realized value. So they're, not only they're irrational, but also they're adding almost no predictability to the future uh, realized values. Now that we know this, uh, now we can uh, take uh, basically whatever subjective leads we have from the rating agencies to various aspects of the credit market. So we'd go no further than people who are working for the same agencies. So basically the credit analysts, they are responsible for giving uh, the actual ratings to the firms. So I think you, you may want to say, wait a minute, so we're talking about basically two different group of people. One group of people who are the chief economists of the rating agencies, they're responsible completely for making all those forecasts, but also we have a separate, separate group of people who are re responsible for uh, the ratings, and they are not exactly the same people, which is a very well valid concern. So that's why we dig into exactly how the ratings are made, and we actually found something uh, that's uh, very useful because in Moody's and also in S&P, in their guidance for the rating process, uh, the rating or credit analysts are explicitly required to incorporate all the forecasts made by their macroeconomists. So essentially, so whatever subjective expectations their uh, economists have is very likely to be adopted as the subjective expectations for the credit rating analyst. So we can then equate uh, the left-hand side to the right-hand side and we can take a look at uh, this question to see do people, especially in this case, do the credit analysts uh, act in accordance with uh, some measure of their own subjective beliefs. So in this regression, we investigate the link between the ratings they gave to different bonds and also uh, link that to their subjective beliefs from their specific agencies. So we regret, so we regress the ratings onto uh, agency level deviation from the consensus and with a, a number of controls. And among the two agencies, we can also take the average ratings and uh, link that to our main variable, which is the AAA deviation. So 
Because we have a translate all the ratings in this, in this descending order, so higher is better, higher is safer. That means if people really act in accordance with whatever subjective beliefs they have, if they're more optimistic, they're basically this uh, deviation is negative, then they're likely to give higher ratings. So you should expect a beta less, that's less than zero if we have a, basically, if people are acting in accordance with their beliefs. And this is exactly what we find uh, in this uh, rate bond level regressions and also in this uh, average rating between the two agencies. I think the one, uh, <clears throat> one thing I wanna do to, before we move on to the next part is really to convince you that this is really related to uh, <clears throat> the, the, the beliefs made by the rating agencies and not by someone else. If we, to do this or to show this, we can do a placebo test. Basically in this test, we randomly sample every quarter. We randomly sample two forecasts from the pool of, of other economists and we can create a time series in a sense and use this time series, we, we re-estimate re the same regressions we had before and we can keep doing this a thousand times and we have a thousand basically uh, uh, coefficients and we can essentially uh, plot the distribution of a thousand, distrib uh, a thousand coefficient and contrast that with uh, whatever uh, coefficient that we have here. And this is what we find. Basically, uh, most if you, we resample uh, forecasts from all the other non-rating agency related uh, subjective beliefs, uh, so their co coefficients are significantly more to the right. And if we look at the actual regression uh, or regression coefficient we had from the previous regression, uh, it is literally at a very left tail of, um, of entire distribution. So this really means that it has to be the beliefs or subjective beliefs from these rating agencies that's driving uh, this results that we have. So they are acting in accordance with whatever beliefs uh, they have. Now let's take a look at uh, two additional aspects, the, the bond level and the, inst uh, and, the, uh, and the firm level, and then we can talk about a little bit about well, what are the drivers of these subjective beliefs. On the bond level, uh, specifically, we we'll, we'll, we'll look at what would happen uh, if investors do not debias or uh, do not debias whatever subjectivity that's embedded in the beliefs. Specifically, we focus on the newly issued bonds because for these bonds, not only the investor base is broader, but also uh, this sub the credit rating is a very important and salient uh, aspect of, a, uh, of the characteristic. So we look at what happened to the initial issuing prices or credit spread, and we look at if this really driven, if there's any mispricing driven by uh, subject beliefs, it is likely to revert because uh, this optimism or pessimism is really unfounded. So subsequently, you should see the opposite happening. And this is uh, what we find here. So if a triple A deviation uh, is, is negative when they're more optimistic, and we have a positive coefficient, that means the credit spread of the newly issued bonds are narrower. Uh, and subsequently, if we keep track of what happened to the new bonds versus the old bonds, we do find that whenever the, the CRAs, rating agencies, are more optimistic, uh, the, uh, the subsequent return of the newly issued bond, the bond that they recently uh, rated, actually goes in the opposite direction. So the return of these bonds uh, is lower. So initial price is higher when the CRAs are more optimistic, but subsequently, because it's related to subjectivity or subjective beliefs, it goes in the opposite direction. So lastly, we link this to the firm behavior. Uh, what happened to the firms? Do firms also fall for uh, the subjective beliefs or do they uh, seem to be a little bit more rational or a little bit, uh, at least should be able to take advantage of this? So we link the triple A deviation uh, with a, a number of uh, firm, level, uh, firm level variables. Ex most importantly, their issuance uh, and their leverage and, uh, and their investment. So whenever, so this is what we find. Whenever the CRAs are more optimistic, meaning that they're having a lower uh, deviation or negative deviation, so we have a negative coefficient, that means they're issuing more debt. The firms are issuing more debt, and they're also increasing their leverage, uh, especially the debt is uh, increased uh, through the long-term borrowing. If we do a placebo test with the equity insurance, we see no effect there. That really means it is related to uh, the inflated rating and the bond insurance. And we can see that they also use a large part of their proceeds uh, in terms of their uh, uh, getting additional assets and investments. So let me put everything uh, in economic terms. For rated firms, for firms that are basically rated by the two agencies, one standard deviation increase in our, a decrease in our main variable of AAA deviation, 
which means the agencies are, uh, once they're in deviation, more optimistic, leads to 3.5 increase in firm leverage and 2% increase in the assets. And over half of the proceeds rated, uh, the <coughs> proceeds uh, raised through the bond issuance are actually invested. So this evidence is consistent with a, a rational manager and irrational market framework where we seem to have a, essentially a long literature uh, on, on this. So knowing that uh, the fact that we document is so huge, uh, it naturally begs the question of what really drives the, this uh, subjective belief of the rating agencies. So an immediate possibility is uh, basically profit incentives because we have a, there's a, basically a number of papers that study uh, uh, the profit incentives of the rating agencies and how they really try to manipulate their ratings so that they can give higher or preferable ratings to uh, firms and they can attract more business. However, however, we find there's no evidence of the channel. So if it's not at the agency level, perhaps it's at the personal level. So it's really maybe the individuals who are actually responsible for all those ratings, some, some aspect of their, uh, their characteristics are driving uh, the variation of the subject ratings. So to do this, or to show a possibility of this, we basically take the rate, the, uh, the forecast now at the personal or individual level. So for each one of the economists, we're now able to uh, calculate their own difference or their own deviation from uh, the consensus. And we request this on uh, basically the economist level dummies. And running on the dummies shows a sizable increase in R square, even when we control for all the aggregate things uh, that can be controlled by uh, a time fix effect, the year quarter fix effect. So this gives us uh, basically some hope. So we wanted to uh, essentially look deeper into uh, the, uh, the behavioral drivers by looking at two very robust behavioral, uh, behavioral biases. So one is that people seem to over extrapolate. This we have known for a long time, but also secondly, people seem to overweight personal experiences when they're making forecasts about something that's more aggregate. So to, to operationalize this, we look at their housing returns as a proxy for their personal wealth. And, uh, because these people's identities are revealed, so we're able to basically collect information uh, on the public records about their housing transactions. So for an economist, if she owns many different houses across many different zip codes, we can essentially calculate a proxy of her own experienced housing return, recent housing return, by looking at the zip code level, uh, Zillow home index, uh, how that changes over a year. So if I have a lot of uh, basically houses across the country, uh, my personal experience will really be uh, determined by how the housing market was doing in each one of the localities. So we do this for all of the economists we have here. For the two agencies, we have in total uh, six to seven economists. And we then link this uh, personal and idiosyncratic housing return to uh, how much they deviate from uh, basically the consensus. And this is what we find. So not only we have a negative coefficient between the personal experience, the housing return, and their deviation from the consensus, in line with whenever they experience more positive housing return, they're more likely to be more optimistic. And second, if we look at R-squared, R-squared also bump quite significantly uh, from a regression without these variables, and which means that we can, so the personal experience, personal experience housing returns seem to explain about 15% additional variation in this, um, uh, in this economist level uh, deviation. And lastly, this idiosyncratic uh, housing return experience also can aggregate. If we take an average among uh, the economists from the two agencies and we we look at, we link that to our main variable, the deviation uh, between uh, deviation between the rating agencies and uh, the rest of the market. They also do like a significantly and also negatively predict or explain the variation of our main variable um, triple A deviation. So we seem to have uncovered a very fascinating scenario where due to the centrality of the rating agency, uh, credit rating agencies, the personal idiosyncratic experiences of these economists seem to have an outsized role, not only on uh, the beliefs made by these agencies, but also through the channels that we have explored on various aspects of the credit market. So, so let me stop here and uh, let me open up to, uh, to the questions. Thanks, Jen, for the presentation. I think we've been, we've been a bit over time. It's fascinating to see that uh, how important it is, uh, the, the, the role of the chief economist for these uh, great agencies and you know, what's, what's, what's behind their subjective beliefs. So you talk a bit about uh, their 
housing situations do do you see differences between, you know, it seems like if they own a house, they would extrapolate. Is it just a local phenomenon or is it because they own? Do you see difference in, in, in terms of they, they go and do transaction on the housing market? So a little bit more about their own experience, how it translates into their subjective belief it would be interesting. So now I, we can open the floor for uh, questions. We have uh, six, seven minutes left. Oh, short question. Mm -hmm. So what I found very interesting, I mean, the, based on these ratings show that the companies then react on the ratings and issue more debt, but that again in, in, in turn changes the rating, right? Like if the company issue, issues more debt that might warrant a worse rating, could this in some sense explain the overreaction that they underestimate you know, their effects on the company, like the ratings direct effects on the company? Sorry, um, so this is Johannes from the Bundesbank. Um, I was wondering about the other groups of investors that you have in your sample, and uh, in particular, this finding that the personal housing return matters quite a bit for their outlook. So it may be that on average, they seem to be quite rational, but it need not be the case that they are individually. So I wonder whether you have looked at this, at the heterogeneity, and whether the housing return also matters for these guys. Any further question? Yeah, maybe you can start with this. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for all the questions. Uh, so yeah, first of all, related to Patrick's questions about the ownership. So we are looking at a group of uh, relatively wealthy uh, individuals and uh, uh, for various reasons, they all own multiple uh, uh, houses or apartments. Uh, that means, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to, to tell like, if this uh, uh, decision to buy a house really can really impact the, uh, their subjective beliefs. Uh, so we, uh, and also like, uh, in our sample period, they do make certain transactions, but the, the transactions are a little bit more sporadical to like, give us enough uh, statistical power to really link that to the variation of the beliefs. But uh, one thing, that's, that's why we resort to, uh, given that you already own a few houses across the country, um, then if you're exposed to uh, the price variations across many, many of these localities, will your personal experience, uh, essentially as a proxy for your personal wealth, return to your personal wealth, will that really impact how you make, uh, uh, form your beliefs? And one thing I want to emphasize, I think is probably also addressed to some of the other questions, is that uh, in, the, in the regression, when we link their personal level uh, deviation from the consensus to the uh, to their personal experience, the housing returns. We also control for the time fix effect or the year quarter fix effect. Basically, we're within the same quarter. We're looking at the differences uh, between different people. Um, so anything that that's driving the aggregate uh, aggregate housing market or aggregate maybe credit market should have been. Uh, at least uh, absorbed by the, the fixed effect we have. So what we are capturing really is, if you own maybe a certain, certain houses on this part of the country, I own houses on the other part of the country, and if there's any deviation or differences between that two, uh, that seemed to explain a lot of the variation uh, of how they make different forecasts. Uh, back to Philip's question. Uh, yes, uh, it's possible that the firms, when they issue more, uh, if they issue a lot, uh, that may also maybe endogenously impact their, uh, their subsequent, maybe sub subsequent ratings. But I think that the timing maybe uh, is uh, slower or longer than the horizon that we're looking at here. So we look at when you first initially issue a bond, then subsequently within the, in the next quarter, uh, do you have a higher or lower return? And we find it's the opposite. Um, so for, and the question of, about the, the, what happened to the other group. Uh, so one response I have to that is a uh, other group on average, they should behave maybe similarly to, to the aggregate or to the average. So that's at least partially controlled for by the year fixed effect. But yeah, there is ongoing work that we're doing here that we are looking at not only really these uh, economists from the CRAs, from the rating agencies, but also across the entire uh, sample of economists where uh, we collect information about their, uh, their housing returns and housing transactions. Uh, that can speak maybe more uh, directly to the question that you have. Uh, because this is a reasonably large sample, so every month we have about 40 to 50 economists that's surveyed by, uh, by, the, uh, by the blue chip. And uh, the, also some people join the sample, some people leave the sample, so in total we're looking at 200 to 300 economists from 
uh, from basically from the early 90s to, to today. So there are some meaningful variations there, and uh, that's a an very exciting area that we're exploring, uh, exploring now. Uh, but thank you very much for the question. Yeah, thank everyone uh, for for the for the discussion and. Uh, I don't think we have questions. Yeah, let me, yeah. Yep. So I think we're one minute uh, before, but I guess uh, that's okay. We can have our next presentation. None the least, Mr. Michael Weber. Okay, well, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for including our paper in the program. Maybe having co-authors in the committee m might help, so definitely uh, thank you. And this joint work with uh, Philip, uh, who is sitting uh, also in the audience, and Andreas Hacketal, who are uh, both just kind of uh, from the other uh, part of town, from Goethe University. And so what we are trying to do in this paper is so shed a little bit of light on how kind of like, you know, people react uh, uh, in their trading behavior to inflation expectations or changes also in uh, realized inflation and you know while kind of uh, Giacomo mentioned this morning that whenever there's kind of news about like inflation or the interest rates like financial markets immediately react we actually know very little for like households behavior and how they view kind of these type of shocks and changes in inflation either for their beliefs but also like for movements in uh, stock market valuations that's effectively what we want to do a little bit in this paper and you could say well look isn't this obvious from an ex-ante perspective like in a couple of months unfortunately I have to start teaching again and you know you open your MBA textbook like the conventional wisdom is like you know stocks are claims on real assets and as such should actually be hatching you against inflation you know that's what I tell my students but unfortunately if actually we're looking at the data doesn't seem to be actually all that well of a description of reality and you know you could argue maybe uh, stock returns tend to be low when actually inflation is up because of like contractionary monetary policy. Maybe prices are sticky, so there is actually a lower path through. Maybe high inflation signals high economic uncertainty, and because of that, and ultimately, like you know, we see kind of returns being lower. And so, like you know, we want to also kind of a little bit understand, kind of, it, to the extent that households do kind of have different views, so whether those views can be ultimately trace back to what Philip earlier, I guess, to some extent, labeled like uh, mental models, and that's also a terminology we want to adopt in our work. And so, like, specifically what we do, we cooperate with a large uh, bank in Germany, happens to have, like, colors very similar to the colors behind me, so, like, you might have a guess which bank we are working with. It's not the ECB, just for clarity. <laughs> and so, like, we then actually uh, go to those uh, customers of that bank, all brokerage clients of that bank, and we run our own customized survey on the clients of this bank to first kind of get an idea how well are they informed. Then to the extent that's a necessary condition that they don't know everything, which might be a surprise after all they are German, so they know it quite a lot. But nevertheless, like you do see that actually there is some lack of uh, knowledge about kind of how stock returns, for example, behave during times of high inflation. And then we actually as researchers try to teach them something through an inform uh, randomized information provision experiment and then subsequently we want to see whether we were successful on the one hand in shifting their beliefs but also and that's kind of where then the bank data comes in can we actually then see that people really change their behavior not only in the survey to like hypothetical portfolio choice but also in actual trading data and then ultimately again coming back to a little bit also of the work of Philip and co-authors uh, of that too we want to actually shed some light on the mental models. And so like, while well, you actually see that Germans are pretty spot on in terms of their perception of average returns, you see that you know, they're quite off. On the one hand, there's lots of dispersion when it comes to like the return impact of inflation, but crucially, on average, they are too optimistic. We then actually provide objective to information about past returns during uh, inflationary periods, and we see that people become more pessimistic. This actually then will allow us to also causally link like return expectations to their hypothetical and actual trading. You do see that there's a pretty strong path through of shifted expected returns due to our treatments into the actual trading behavior. Now let me just tell you a little bit more about kind of the sample we are working with. As I mentioned, this large uh, German bank. We at some point in the beginning of 2022 
fielded a survey in cooperation with that bank. The way it works administratively, like the bank sends an email to their clients on a regular basis. I still have uh, an account for, my, I guess, my former pocket money with that bank. I do get those emails, and I never opened any of them. So, like, you know, many uh, type of emails are sent by the bank. I think what helps us is that the subject line stated that it's actually a research study on the topic of inflation and financial markets. So, like, the response rate in our survey is actually pretty high in the sense that it's like two to three times the response rate the bank typically gets. And it also directly states it's in cooperation with Goethe University in Frankfurt. So, you know, you might be concerned immediately about selection issues. I talk a little bit about that. And so, like, as I mentioned, like, we uh, fielded this survey in the beginning of 2022, like uh, roughly 3,000 completes. And then we get pretty much whatever the bank observes on those clients. We as researchers can also observe. Just to kind of refresh maybe a little bit kind of like our memory, how did the beginning of 2022 look like? Inflation had already increased to 5%, but actually was definitely far off from the peak that was above 11% in Germany. That's the left y-axis you see. On the right y-axis depicted is just the value of the German benchmark index, the so-called DAX. And here you see pretty nicely that you know there's a pretty strong negative correlation between inflation and the level of the German stock market index. Now, how does our uh, sample of uh, survey participants look like? They actually don't differ all that much from the average population of cli or brokerage clients of that bank, but certainly they don't look like the average German. They are way more highly educated compared to an average college completion rate of maybe only 29%. They are wealthier and they have a higher portfolio value with kind of what we see in the bank relative to, for example, the panel of household finances by the Bundesbank. And also, like, they have a pretty high equity share. And on average, they trade, like, twice a month, which is maybe a bit higher for, compared to the data that it might, you, uh, might, you might be familiar with from, like, Chile or Dal. But, of course, like, you know, if you invest with Vanguard, you know, you might also be very different than kind of a, a client of a brokerage house. Now, in terms of like inflation, it's maybe no surprise if you know the work by Dimitris and Jeff uh, in Econometrica, you know, in times of when high infla inflation is high, people in fact are actually pretty spot on what the prevailing inflation rate is, 5% at the time of the survey, 5% on average by our survey respondents. They actually also are good in terms of the change relative over the last 12 months. And they actually self-report that actually they traded due to inflation, 42% over the last 12 months. And they also think it's a top three concern for their wealth relative to, for example, to you know, GDP uh, downturn, hike in interest rates or higher unemployment or even corona, you know, not nearly as important as inflation. Structure of the th uh, survey, pretty common, like you elicit priors and some basic demographics and views. Then we do a randomized information provision experiment. Control group, no additional information. Three treatment groups that we kind of build up, like uh, step by step. One group, only information about inflation. One group, only information about uh, returns during past inflationary periods. A third group, like a mixture of the first two and additional reasons why you potentially see these return patterns. Subsequently, everyone gets the same questions again, posterior return expectations, narratives for why they think certain things are as they are, but then also like first a hypothetical portfolio choice experiment, and then we follow customers forward in the trading data from the bank to also see how they actually change their behavior. Now the first treatment, just to kind of give you an idea, like you know, this is effectively like a little bit kind of what we saw in the very first talk, by Shu this morning, we kind of combine different aspects. Like we have like a sentence where we describe that maybe actually in fact the ECB might have not done that poorly of a job as many Germans think. Over the last 10 years, actually inflation is really low and only recently actually it has increased. We also actually document that graphically. And then we also list a couple of reasons why potentially inflation might have gone up, including like uh, the Russian invasion in Ukraine and the subsequent uh, energy surge. Then the second group kind of gets the uh, only information on like the returns during past uh, inflationary periods for different asset classes. This is now just a hypothetical like treatment screen. Remember, we first actually elicit prior return expectations unconditionally 
and then conditional on being in inflationary times, which we define similar to Cam Harvey and co-authors. Inflation actually having gone through uh, uh, 4% and peaking above 4%, that's kind of the definition we use. And here on the left uh, y-axis, you see the different financial assets like Germany, kind of the benchmark index in Japan and the US, but also sub-indices and also gold and uh, fixed income. And here you see, like, you know, imagine, like you had said, you know, I thought that during past inflationary periods, the DAX had returned, like, I don't know, 2%. And then, like, I see that the actual return was only 1%. So, like, I click every single time the bar, what I had answered, and what the actual truthful information is pops up with a short one-sentence summary documenting that information. Then in the third treatment group, effectively combining the first two tier pieces of information, but also a little bit of kind of an enhancement, so to speak, in the ex uh, to the extent that we tell them, for example, you know, energy stocks typically tend to perform, relatively speaking, quite well, because energy or commodities more generally are often a driver of inflation. Think about supply shocks, so like we uh, provide this piece of information, or similarly for gold, you say, you know, oftentimes gold is perceived as a safe haven. And then, you know, someone uh, mentioned earlier, like demand-based asset pricing, like if you have flow into a kind of gold, of course, you might then see high gold returns. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about prior returns. So here, what do you think has been the return per year of the German DAX since 1950? Actual information is 8%, and you see quite a few people that invest with that specific bank is pretty spot on, so like quite a few people uh, answer like the right number and also relatively little dispersion around the, the mode of the responses. Now when it comes to kind of the return impact of inflation, here just for simplicity what we do, we kind of subtract from the past return during inflationary periods the unconditional estimate, and this is not just for the German DAX, it's very similar for the other asset classes. What you see is on the one hand, lots of dispersion. Some people think that when inflation is high, returns were lower than unconditionally. Others think it's higher unconditionally. On average, people, however, are too optimistic and think returns are way more positive relative to what they actually were. Does it matter for how people form expectations going forward? That's kind of what we try to depict here in this graph. I'm personally not yet sure whether it's kind of the best way of showing that pattern, but what you see here, that's the difference what I think the return of the DAX was during past inflationary periods minus the unconditional return. That's what you see on the x-axis. So like if I'm to the far right, I really think that during high inflation, returns were high. And then on the y-axis, what you see is what I think the return will be going forward. And here you see like if I think High inflation times tend to be times of high returns. I also think going forward that the return of the DAX will be high. Now let me briefly mention the type of the mental models we elicit. It's slightly different to what we saw in the previous talk rather than actually eliciting mental models with kind of like open-ended text. We had a little bit more structure in randomized fashion. We provided different theories that could actually give us different links between inflation and stock returns. So like this uh, conventional, I guess, uh, MBA knowledge on like, you know, the real assets type of idea, maybe like, you know, the sticky price mechanism, this economic uncertainty mechanism, a standard money illusion mechanism, or like, you know, Fisher uh, kind of debt uh, devaluation mechanisms. So like they're provided in randomized fashion and we ask to which extent do you agree? And here you see actually there's quite a bit of dispersion to the far left, I completely disagree. To the far right, I completely agree. It seems like, you know, maybe some people went to booth for an MBA. You know, normally Germans don't take MBAs, but maybe like uh, in the master program, they use similar textbooks. Like this idea that stocks are real assets seems to be actually quite prevalent. Similarly, you see, however, also that, you know, Germans dislike inflation, maybe because they think it goes hand in hand with high economic uncertainty. That's also certainly quite prevalent. Whereas, like, you know, the least agreed idea seems to be like a standard money illusion type of idea. This is now purely for the control group because, remember, we elicited those narratives or the agreement with those after the information provision. But to the extent, like, we do a good job in randomizing, and it seems to be the case, that should be representative for the overall population of survey participants. 
Now, does it actually matter for like what I think actually kind of uh, describes the data the best in ter terms of what I think actually is the return impact of inflation? So here, the agreement to the different narratives is on the y-axis, uh, is on the x-axis, and the y-axis is then, you know, difference in uh, nominal returns during past high inflation periods minus the unconditional return. And kind of if I'm actually uh, believing that dividends go up with inflation, I'm also the one in the survey that thinks that during past inflationary periods, returns were way, way higher than unconditionally. Okay, so now what I want to do is kind of like understand whether the different treatments do provide information for how people afterwards think about the returns of different asset classes. Remember, so the way we did that, we have different treatments, only inflation, only past returns during inflationary periods, all the two combined, including, however, also a short description why potentially these type of patterns might have materialized. You'll also see like tons of controls. Let me not spend time here. And what you see if you now request posterior, one year ahead returns on the treatment dummy, so we can interpret it directly relative to the control group. You see different treatments, different asset classes. You do see like inflation expectations do not shift at all what actually people think will be the nominal return across the different asset classes. Now you could say, Michael, actually you showed earlier, like people were spot on, no news, no reaction. That's kind of like, you know, exactly this type of idea that maybe people are already informed. I show you that it's actually not fully consistent with that in a little second. Instead, what you see, like if you then see that the ducks, in fact, had kind of maybe lower returns than what you thought unconditionally on average across everyone. You see that people up way downwards than nominal one year had ducks return. You see that people become more optimistic for the Nikkei and also for gold. And in general, you do see that having like a little, I don't know, narrative or description why maybe the Nikkei had high returns during past German inflationary periods seems to give you a little bit of an additional boost. So in the case of, for example, the Nikkei, we had the description that, you know, international diversification can actually allow you to recoup higher returns because inflation is not necessarily perfectly correlated all the time across countries. Now, of course, you could say, well, Michael, like, you know, now you look at average treatment effects, but if I knew already everything, I shouldn't react versus like, you know, if I'm clueless, I should react maybe more to that type of information. So now what we want to do, we want to create like a variable that we call kind of perception gap. What is the difference between what, what, between what we told survey participants and what they thought that information is? And then we want to see whether this perception gap modulates how people are react to the treatment information. And so like effectively now we enhance a little bit the regression specification where we now also want to still focus on the estimated beta coefficient, so the treatment dummy, however, this time interacted with the amount of news that a given treatment provided to an individual survey participant. And what you do see here is like you pretty much see that most of the reaction you know, is down here from the second and the third uh, treatments do arise because people have non-zero perception gaps or saying it differently, you know, I see that maybe the return to like uh, energy stocks is in fact higher than what I thought. If I get that information, I react uh, positively. Maybe it's actually more instructive to look at that graphically. So now what do you see here in this figure? You see on the x-axis what I thought, let's say the return of the DAX was, subtracting that from what it actually was. So a negative number means now in reality, the return was 1%. I thought it was 16%. So therefore, I would be uh, all the way to the left. And then on the y-axis, you see posterior returns. And now what you see, like, you know, there's this downward sloping line. In orange, that's the first treatment relative to the control group. You already see, like, the slopes are almost identical. So people just don't react to that treatment, even if they were misinformed. Instead, the other two treatments Actually, like if I ex ante thought it's 16%, my posterior will be 6% or 5%. That's how you can read this figure. So quite a strong convergence towards the provided information. Let me just maybe skip that. So like we also show directly in the papers, so like, you know, you could say 
maybe the first treatment didn't even shift inflation expectations, but that's not the case. You still see that people do update their inflation expectations, and then you zoom into those that reacted in their inflation expectations. Do they update their return expectations? The answer is no. And this may be, you know, reminiscent a little bit maybe of uh, Erwan Gauthier and Philippe Andraden co-authors. Like, they show, like, you know, once inflation has reached a certain limit, you know, maybe now the exact level is no longer that relevant for how you uh, make economic decisions. And so the last part, let me just now first uh, show you evidence from this hypothetical information uh, portfolio choice experiment that's very similar to like the uh, portfolio choice experiment in the AR paper by Georg Arakos and Kenny. So imagine you have 10,000 euros, how would you allocate them? And then you see whether the allocation is different if you actually receive different information relative to the control group. And again, this hypothetical setting you see like relative to the control group, information about inflation doesn't shift the needle, whereas learning that DAX returns were way lower maybe than what I thought. I invest substantially less hypothetical money in the DAX, and you know, this hypothetical experiment is useful because in reality, of course, there are all types of frictions and constraints as the work by Johannes Beutel, for example, has shown. So in this setting, you can fully abstract by that. But then you could still be concerned that maybe, you know, an editor in the audience say, well, you know, that's hypothetical portfolio choice. What do we actually learn in actual data? That's what we actually do with the bank uh, trading data. And so like here, what you see, if you request the subsequent bias, cross bias in the left panel, net bias in the right panel, relative to the purchases in the month before the survey intervention, you do see that this uh, third treatment has quite a significant impact on cross buys in the month after our information provision. And then of here, of course, is a purely simple kind of regression on treatment dummies. We can, of course, also now instrument posterior returns by our treatment dummies to uh, establish this causal link between posterior expected returns and subsequent trading. And you see here qualitatively very similar that in the up to four months after the information provision, people in fact actually buy more German stocks when they have higher returns. Of course, we did see that the treatment lowers returns, like this is consistent with our previous table that you know, negative news about the German stock returns during past inflationary periods leads to a selling of German securities. So like, let me uh, maybe stop here. You know, maybe some of us are hungry, at least I am. And so like, uh, let's open it for questions. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, um, Michael, for the presentation. Any questions, everyone? Wilbert. Wilbert Van der Klauw, New York Fed. Um, so the way people react to the information, you would expect to depend on how certain or uncertain they are. Do you have any measures of that? Uh, like when you look at the effect of the perception gap, are there... Are there maybe other, you know, measures that you can derive from your data in terms of how they invest uh, and see if you, have, you know, it, it's, yeah, the, the effect that you capture are kind of moderated by uncertainty, which could be correlated with the perception gap. So it'd be interesting to look at it. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, Chen Wang from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, so, Michael, so I was wondering, so despite the fact you trade people with different information, but in like Germany is probably a special sample where people do seem to have a lot, like uh, already a lot more background information about inflation. So have you looked at, for example, a is age an important determinant of uh, how people re would respond? Because if you're older, you have m perhaps more knowledge or at least heard something about the hyperinflation era. Uh, for younger generation, that memory certainly has faded. So is there any kind of variation in that regard? Yuri? Yuri you see Berkeley. I have a related question. How much do you know about these investors, their age, gender, confidence, uh, previous returns, experiences? Maybe this is going to affect the heterogeneity in, uh, in, in the reaction function.
Stefano Ramelli, University of St. Gallen. I was thinking your information provision um, treatment is mostly empirical in nature. So you said in the past that we had this negative correlation. Have you thought also about having an information provision that is theoretical in nature, trying to explain why that is the case? I know it's very complicated, but it would be interesting to see if you find any, maybe that change people's mind uh, more than just the empirical evidence. Let's maybe start at the very uh, end. So first of all, like, thanks a lot for all the great uh, comments and uh, questions, definitely much appreciated. So like, you know, I'm totally with you, Stefano, that it would be totally uh, interesting understanding, like whether, you know, take the narratives we had, if you were to treat people with those narratives, how people reacted to it. But given that, you know, when we started that project, we didn't even know anything really about how people react in terms of how well informed they even are about kind of returns during past inflationary periods. And we thought like almost like a natural first step is kind of like just telling them kind of empirically motivated kind of evidence similar to the work by Neville and Kim Harvey and those uh, guys. Like, uh, you know, see whether you know, people are informed and whether they react to that type of information. Now just more generally, like do people maybe uh, react to some, I don't know, call it theoretically motivated type of mechanisms? So like maybe I can, uh, use that question to motivate or kind of advertise some of the work that uh, Philip has done also with that type of data, but they, he looks actually at kind of like a kind of asset and debt erosion channel, but this is more theoretically motivated and then see how people react to that. And that's maybe at least partially like uh, an answer. Now you are totally like, you know, there certainly is quite a bit of heterogeneity in like, you know, how women versus men, different ages, uh, educational backgrounds, how they form uh, stock market beliefs unconditionally. And you see that correlation extremely in the prior return, this expected returns. Now, when it comes to the reaction to the provided information, you don't see that, that strong of an effect. Now, of course, I think we can maybe uh, do a little bit more on this also nicely collects, uh, connects to Wilbert's question, whether we can maybe kind of like a uh, subsample a bit more and look at interaction terms with uh, proxies for uncertainty. I think that would certainly be, as you say, like very interesting because if I'm more uncertain uh, ex ante, you would expect from a Bayesian updater to react more to that. We definitely uh, will look into that to see whether we can come up with good proxies. Now, one thing actually I should mention, so like in the talk today, we focused on a sample, uh, the overall sample of survey participants. Now, of course, one heterogeneity that is quite relevant for the actual trading behavior is like, do you actually trade? So like, if you look at the subsample of people that at least had like two trades in the previous month, the results I showed you here are substantially stronger. So this is just unconditionally, but maybe there are some people that are more retirement investors. Once you take them out and you look at active uh, traders, so to speak, the results become stronger. Now in terms of like, uh, related to maybe like, you know, what Yuri also was saying in terms of age and uh, the reaction to that. I slightly disagree, Chen, with you in the sense that, you know, the young people didn't live through like uh, the hyperinflation of 100 years ago. I think most of the people uh, in Germany are not uh, more than 100 years old. Nevertheless, you do see that uh, geographic variation across towns does in uh, the extent of the hyperinflation in the early 1920s shapes actually current day heterogeneity inflation expectations. Some very nice work by Felix von Meyerink, uh, Fabio Braccion, and also like um, Nick Schaub from WHO. So like there's actually this link, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm totally with you that we, we should actually maybe explore this link with, with age and the reaction a, a bit more under empirically. Maybe w one last point, uh, as we have two minutes left. So do you see some implications? Because y you mentioned some, some of these people, they would probably, you know, misallocate some of their money and, and goes to the stock market where they shouldn't have, they should have relocated differently. But, but it seems when you look at the reality, other people did differently. So, so do you see any, any, any implication from that? Do you see real? Uh, misallocation yeah. from, from groups and, and consequences for the economy, spending, they have different types of spending. Do, we, do you see any implication or just 
these people that behave this way, but other actors out there are, are, are behaving way differently. That's an excellent uh, question. Definitely also like a, a very deep question in the sense like, what is the optimal uh, behavior? So like, should people then divest when once inflation starts picking up? But you know, we do know that empirically it's really, really hard to time the market. And then like, you know, now maybe uh, people go out of the stock market and never come back. So like, that's of course uh, one concern. Alternative concern could be, well, maybe people st uh, stick in the, stay in the market and then they see kind of the market tanking by 10, 15%. Maybe they scare and then they leave and never come back. So like, I wouldn't know really now on the spot, like, you know, what, uh, what I would recommend people to do. And so like, I would definitely think it's a super interesting question and certainly deserves more work. But I can see that, you know, it can go in either way. And so in, th in that sense, like, I'm a little bit hesitant of making a general statement. Fair enough. Okay, so I think uh, that concludes the second session. I would like to thank all uh, presenters and participants. And I think uh, we're basically right on time for cutting for, for the lunch. And uh, we'll be back uh, here around 2 p.m. Thank you, everyone.